morning. Good morning. Am I coming through? Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. We're going to start out with a song called Faith of Our Fathers. And uh, this song is talking about the church fathers that kept the church going right from the very beginning. And as fathers, what a responsibility we have to train our kids up to know Jesus. And it only takes one generation to mess it up, doesn't it? Uh, you take a look at the world today and it's pretty evident. And I think for all of us fathers in here, we need to be determined to say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. So, faith of our fathers. <clears throat> faith of our fathers living still in spite of my father's world. <clears throat> This 
is my father's world Oh, let me ne'er forget That though the wrong seems off so strong God is the ruler yet This is my father's world The battle is not done Jesus who died shall be satisfied And earth and heaven be one If we can have the ushers now, we're going to take the morning offering. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for all the fathers who are here and pray your blessing on each one of them. Help each of us to live for you that we, uh, many of us have already raised our kids, but we have grandkids and Lord, uh, this, this world is a mess and just help us to to be a shining light for you to them, to, that they would carry on uh, the faith of our fathers. I just pray for this offering, Lord. Bless it to the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and the Prince of Peace. He promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that would not cease. Well, I tried him and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell just what Jesus really means to me. He And my mind can conceive he's more wonderful than my heart can believe he goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams he's everything that my soul Ever long for everything he's promised and so much more he's more than amazing more than marvelous more than miraculous could ever be he's more than wonderful that's what Jesus Come 
to live within the heart of man. I marvel just to know he really loves me when I think of who he is and who I am. For he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for, everything he's promised and so much more. He's more than amazing. More than marvelous, more than miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is to me. He's everything that my soul ever loved. promise and so much more he's more than amazing more than marvelous more than miraculous could ever be he's more than wonderful more than Greeting time. Go greet.
not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my life be thou my Christians have been singing that song for about 1,300 years. It always fascinates me to think generations have come and gone, and we're still singing it. And that was dependent on fathers passing down to their sons and daughters, this is the way you live. This is, this is how you live. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore Lay my life. 
for sure to you that um, Wayne and Nancy Barnes their son Jason uh, last night was hit by a car over in the Mesick area and um, I talked to them before church this morning and he's on uh, the ventilator right now and they, they say he's brain dead and um, they're not giving him a whole lot of hope and so she's just uh, right now they're really agonizing on, on what to do so we're going to go uh, with see them when church is over today but uh, especially on today this being Father's Day for for them uh, just pray for them for that she said I know God can still work a miracle but I don't know exactly what to do and I can't I, I, I have been in that situation other times but sure not with my child and don't know what to tell them except to keep trusting the Lord and, and he'll give them the instruction on what to do so let's pray for them for sure uh, and for Jason this morning and little Donna is here though isn't that a fantastic wonderful thing And her and Pastor Dave celebrated 50 years of marital bliss on Friday. Isn't that good? Yeah. So this is probably the, I've had people get mad at me and not want to come to church, but she's had the longest streak of not coming to church uh, of anybody, like three months, I think. But she finally, God has forgiven her, and uh, she's back today. We have prayed and prayed and prayed, and I think and prayed some more, and her family sure has prayed. And uh, just to see her little face sitting here smiling this morning is a miracle of God, amen? And so we know what he can do. And we also know what we're praying for him to do. And so somewhere in the middle there, we just want him to have his way because when he has his way, that's when good things happen, amen? So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for how Mike has just brought us to your feet in worship today and how Jim has sung about um, you being our father and how wonderful you are and um, yeah, we have our eyes set on the greatest place anyone has ever created for us when we get to heaven. And we're just trying to get there. We're trying to mind you. We're trying to live lives that are pleasing to you. And, and we can't live anybody else's life for them. We're just trying to do our best. And so this morning, God, we pray that you would have your way, and especially for Wayne and Nancy right now, the thoughts that are in their mind, that the agony in their heart, the decisions that they're having to make and what's happening around them. We, we could pray so many things and we could pray for you to touch Jason right now and to do a miracle there. And we could ask you to give them the courage to do what uh, they need to do. We, we don't know. This is the most helpless we can ever feel uh, even as a church family because we can't do anything for them. But we can talk to the Almighty. And that's what we're doing. This is not a last resort. This is our only hope. So we call out to you for them. And we ask you to just meet them right where they are at that hospital at this very moment. And we're so thankful to see Donna with us today. What a great answer to prayer for her to be in church and how, how you've touched her. And there's still things ahead of them that they have to decide on, but we're just thankful that she's able to be here today. And we just pray you bless her and her whole family this morning. Uh, so many other people that still need our touch for Raymond, for Pete in Virginia, uh, for so many others around us that are sick. Uh, so many other things that are happening for the lost. Most of all, God, we pray if there is a soul in this sanctuary today who does not have the, the utter assurance of knowing that you are the Lord of their lives, then I pray today through something that's said or done, you would speak to their hearts and help them realize their need of a Savior this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Dave would like to come and, and address us. So you can be seated. <clears throat> but let's give Pastor Dave a big hand as he comes. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for your kindness, your thoughtfulness, your cards, your gifts, your phone calls, your visits, but most of all, your prayers, because that's what brought her through. After that Sunday that pastor anointed me here, 
the next week is when she opened her eyes. And she's been a miracle ever since. Yes, two days ago we celebrated 50 years. Teenagers, I met her when she was 16 years old. You know where I met her? In church. You don't have to go outside to find a good Christian lady. We dated for five years. And then we got married. I had made my mind up the first day I seen her. It just took her a little while longer to realize that I was the one that she was supposed to be with the next 50 years. But on March 8th, and for 19 days after that, I didn't think we were going to make it to this point. In fact, the night before she woke up, I had told the girls that was on a Monday night, I said, by Friday, if she doesn't have any movement, I'm not going to make her suffer any longer. The next morning, her eyes were open. She was smiling. And you know, she has been smiling ever since. <laughs> Even when she's doing all the coughing that she does and everything else and what she's gone through. Tomorrow she's got to go see, see a throat doctor and there may be more operations coming. We know we're not through. But we wouldn't be this far if it hadn't been for you folks. And Donna told me this morning on the way here, <laughs> Now you tell them exactly what the way I tell you. And she put her little finger in my face and she said, you tell them, tell pastor that I love him and his family and I love my church family. Everyone of you. Well, I know we couldn't have a big celebration for our 50th, but we want to share with you and celebrate with you. So I hope that I know it's Father's Day and you, some of you got plans, but if you could come back to the fellowship area after church and have a piece of cake because my daughter's got more cake back there than I can eat. So uh, the rest of you got to come back and eat it up. But uh, we, uh, we just appreciate each one of you and love you and we invite you back for that. God has been so good. And to have her be able to come on Father's Day, on our anniversary, and to come to church. She hasn't been here since the end of February. And God has just been working. We know we got a long trail ahead of us yet. But I believe God brought her this far. He's not going to stop now, and he's got something great for her. We had a little get-together at the nursing home yesterday for us. And she even went to the piano and played piano while Becky and Kimmy sang for the group. So she didn't forget how to go like this. I can't even do it now, but she did it after all this. But I just praise God for, as Pastor would say, sweet Donna is here with me and with you today. Come on back after the fellowship. By the way, pastor promised me, because I told him Donna couldn't sit long, he promised me a short message. <laughs> Did I really? I don't remember saying it. I'm not sure. What I do remember is telling Donna once your first Sunday back, you could preach. Remember that? Yeah, she suddenly acting like she can't hear me now when I said that. Um, Yes, there is cake back there. Maybe, um, maybe we'll get there before it gets stale, hopefully, right? Um, appreciate each one of you. Who made the cake anyway? Becky? Did Becky make the cake? No, Becky takes the cake. That's what they said. Yeah, she made some of it. Okay, well, I can't wait to see this creation of cake then for sure. Somebody turns, what do you turn Tuesday, Janet? 50? Is that Celsius or what is that, 50? <laughs> Yeah, 80, 80, 80, I mean, Rodney, aren't you like 96 or something? You robbed the cradle when you married her, didn't you? Um, 
Janet turns 80 on Tuesday. And yeah, isn't that good? <laughs> and they had a party yesterday that I think the law is still looking for the cleanup of, of what happened over there, but they had a great time. So Janet has a great birthday. Today is Pete and Virginia's 68th anniversary. Today. Today. And we talk about journeys and, and slogging through and, and issues and uh, lots of turmoil and lots of things happening. Boy, that your family has gone through it uh, in the last several, several, many, many, many months. And, uh, but Pete's still at home and still directing the orchestra best he can, I guess, right? And trying his best, but 68 years together. Uh, it's fantastic, isn't it good? We, you know, the devil tries to get us to think about all the negative stuff. There's more to celebrate than there is to get mad about, amen? There really is, there really is. And we need to stay that way, don't we? Bev's flagging a plane down back there. Sebastian turns 15 today. He's back. Where are you at? Is he in here still? Where'd he go? Is he over there? Caden, you act like you're happy that he's gone in the back. What's with that? 15, and he's about 7 foot 1. You see how tall that kid is getting for sure. Um, anything else I'm forgetting? Anybody else have? Uh, let me talk about yesterday real quick. Yesterday was the block party uh, that we had. We had over 60 kids that registered to come in the pouring rain. Uh, there was an ark somebody was trying to build before we got started yesterday, I think. But uh, they came, they st and they were waiting before we were even all the way set up to come and have fun and play. 4-1 did a great job singing there. The Stand Strength team always does a great job with a great message. And we had a lot of great, everybody that did anything for that, I need to thank you for that. Everybody did a great job that was involved in it. Uh, it was a great, great time. And we just try to continue to make it better every year. But it was a great time. Face painting, Adele. I remember I asked Adele, I said, hey, uh, did you ever face paint before? And uh, she said, yeah, I try to cover Dave's face up every day, but it just keeps running back off. And uh, no, she didn't say that. Did you? Maybe you did. I could, I could keep, I could convince myself you said it, right? Um, but she said, how hard, this is why I love our church. Here's, here, and I am going to preach and try to get out by one. Um, she said, I've, how hard could it be? That was her answer. And I'm like, I could hear angels singing already by that time, Pat. She said, how hard could it be? And I said, I don't know. I've never done it. She said, sure. And then she texted me back later. She said, you know, so we don't have one big long line. Can I have somebody help me? I've, and I've already talked to Patty Weatherwax. I'm like, well, you can't get any more angelic than the two of them sitting over there. So they had a line that never quit right next to the hot dogs where Dave was cooking the hot dogs yesterday. It's just a great fun time when our church family gets together and there's no... We're not thinking about what's next or anything. Oh, just a fun time. And we had a good time, didn't we? So now all the dads, speaking of fun, stand up. Every father in the building, would you stand up, please, this morning so we can honor you today. Yes, good job. Amen. Stay on your feet a minute. You can tell we've got all ages uh, sizes, backgrounds, whatever, but they all have one thing in common. They love their families. And so I want to pray over the dads this morning while they're here today. I'm worried about Pat. There's a bad cut under his eye right there. I don't know how that happened, but maybe I shouldn't know. Um, but Father, I thank you for this day set aside. You know, you are our Father. You know all about what it means to, to lead and to love and to plan and to, to keep secure what you hold the dearest to your heart and that's your family the day I got to become a father uh, outside of when I became called of God and when you saved me one of the greatest days of my life because it changed my perspective I'm no longer worried about myself my heart now turns outward to think of the children you blessed me with and whether you have one or ten it doesn't make you any less or more of a father you love the people that, and the children that have been entrusted to you and so I pray for every gentleman standing at this very moment in this room that you would continually uh, infuse them with wisdom, with uh, humor, with patience, knowing when to move and when not to move, knowing how to handle things of life. And Mike said it, the world today we live in is upside down, but you're not. And so we trust you that we can lead the very best that we can. Admit when we make mistakes and hold true and firm to the word of God. So we thank you that you've given us great men 
in this room today that lead their families with all their heart. Continue to guide them, fill them with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, men. Thank you very much. On, on the tables out here when you leave, and this is actually for all the men and the young boys, there's little flashlights that we also got uh, at the Father's Day dinner Friday night. By the way, Jim, great job on the Father's Day dinner. That was, uh, it's always a great time to come in and just be able to sit down and eat. And the men, listen, I think you ladies spent like five hours here when you had your meal. We were in and out and no one even knew we were here, I think. Uh, by the time we got in, the cleanup took boom. Uh, it was very efficient and done well. But Jim, you always do a great job playing the Father's Day dinner. So thank you very much. Because we want to eat and get home and sleep. That's why, JC. That's it right there. Um, so we, we're looking at Paul this morning in uh, 2 Corinthians. And Paul in 2 Corinthians um, is, is talking about himself, but he's talking about himself in the third person, Gary. He's, he's mentioning something that happens to him in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that it, it, there's a lot of times people talk about Paul being very knowledgeable and Paul going through what he did as, as, as he persecuted the church and as he um, grew in his faith as well after that once he became a Christian. But I want you to understand there was nothing about him that was self-serving or um, thinking that he was better than anyone. In fact, when you see a lot of other scriptures that, that are, are his writings, he's always very, very, very quick to point out the fact that he's undeserving of any of the goodness that God has given him and that he realized that had he got what he deserved, Pastor Dave, he sure wouldn't be sitting here writing uh, to who would become the church. He would have been long gone, long before that. Isn't that how all of us feel? If I would get what I deserve, I sure wouldn't be standing here in a great place amongst a bunch of great people. But I'm thankful that God does not give us what we deserve. He's made a way to give us his love and his forgiveness, amen? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today because I don't think that I... I can't speak for anybody else. You know, I always want to shy away from making bold statements, Tom. Uh, I can't speak for the whole country. I can't speak for every church that's out there. I can't speak for every pastor. I can speak for myself. And I can say that I am sure on an average day, Rob Feckety, I still don't thank God enough for his grace, his mercy that I did not earn. I'm thankful that it can't be earned. Because, Jim, if it could be earned, there's a lot of talented people, way more talented than me, that would store up a lot. I'd be left behind. But I'm thankful that it's just based on my devotion and my obedience to him, Lucy, and that's what it comes down to. Amen? And so Paul's talking here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, um, he's, he's leading up to here, he's getting ready to finish up this, these two letters to the Corinth church, and... <coughs> As he finishes up uh, talking about in chapter 11 about false apostles and how he suffered as one, now he says, Here, here's what I want to do. And the reason he does this example is because he's trying to make the point across to people that there is benefit in even suffering, Gary, as a Christian. And I truly wonder what suffering actually really means. I've never really suffered a day in my life. I really haven't. I mean, I'm embarrassed that I dropped my glasses in front of you. That's as worse as it gets. If that's the worst thing that happens to me today, I've got it made. Amen? Six of you would have probably evaporated. Oh, no, my glasses fell on the floor. Big deal. Glasses fall on the floor all the time. Amen? I find glasses in my son's room all the time. The child goes to bed at night with a glass of milk. Let me just, and oh, that sounds cute, doesn't it? Little kid drinking no cookies, nothing like that. But he gets milk, and he gets the biggest glass we have in the cupboard. When I say biggest glass, he gets a wheelbarrow to wheel the glass. It's as tall, I mean, we're talking about that big. And he walks away, good night. And he walk, I'm like, well, we won't see that glass for two weeks. And what makes his mom, yeah, what makes his mom even more mad is that even when he drink it all, there's always a dot of milk that stays in the glass. Well, that dot of milk runs to the bottom and it begins to make a science project on the bottom of the glass. And when you walk in his room, you're like, huh, wonder what we're growing in these little dishes over here. And there's always about, and you know I'm exaggerating, 11 of them on his, on his desk next to his bed. And he's asleep. When I go to wake him up, he's over there. 
you know, in the bed like that. I look and I go, I don't understand how you're not having nightmares with all this over here, you know? So you walk out like this and you take it over there. And so there's always something to humble us. No matter how great I am, I still am reminded that I'm not, I'm not too good to carry dishes out of my kid's room. And spare me, I'm going to have parents telling me, I made my kids. No, you didn't. Don't start telling me what kind of boot camp you ran at home. No, you didn't. I know better than that. They always try to tell me that they did. My kids did. When I snapped, they jumped. And when I said this, they did that. And I go, when I snap, everybody looks around going, what's that sound? Did I tell you the one about when I decided I wanted to make a face, Bailey, to make my kids behave? Here's a dad story, right, on Father's Day. My mom had a look. Moms are born with a look. All moms have to do is turn their head, and Brenda, any idea I had of sinning went out the window. But my, you know, my dad could also, he could kind of turn. There was once in a while he had a good look. Well, I thought, I'm going to get a look, Ben. And I asked God, God, give me something where I can contort my face and make my kids just want to go, oh, no, dad's mad, right? Wade probably just rubs his mustache and the kids all just fall on the floor that's why I've been trying to grow one ever since I met him like that and this is what I get right here this puff on my chin but I was Connor was acting up in church once he was like two I think and he was back there having his own service with his mom and I was trying to preach up in the front I looked back at him a couple times and he wouldn't look at me and finally he caught my eye and I went in the middle of the sermon like that I went look made a face like that you know what he did he went yeah don't do that again right he's looking at me right now and I, I made it again he goes I could hear him tell mom hey mom dad's making faces at me this is fun I gave that up you know why because I'm not in control but God is in all my best efforts all I'm going to do is pull a muscle in my neck trying to be the man when I can just turn everything over to him and allow his grace to work in my life Are you with me don't wear yourself out trying to be in charge. Let God take over. And so Paul's telling that. He goes, as, after he's talking about the suffering as, as an apostle, and he says, under uh, the end of, of chapter 11, he talks about all of the, the beatings and the jail time that he took. He said in verse 12, or verse 1 of chapter 12, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. God did more positive things Pat than he did any other time in life and so he says in, in uh, verse 3 he said that, verse 2 I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether in a body or out of the body I do not know God knows and I know that this man was caught into paradise whether in a body or out of the body I do not know God knows and he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter and on behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Now, there's always a think tank full of people that know everything. And there's people that, that write stuff, Mike, and say that Paul's talking about himself here, which he probably is, because he's trying to not make it look like I've experienced all there is to experience and I'm wonderful. If I try to use uh, experiences in the Bible when you, when you teach or when you preach, it's always good to use personal stuff, yes, but sometimes it's always good to just get in the Word and use the people in the Bible as an example. And so as I'm using Paul today, Paul's actually kind to take the same thing, Mr. Arrington, and saying, uh, hey, here's a guy a long time ago, he got caught up into the, the highest point in heaven he possibly could he was carried away out of the world in his spirit in his prayer time God lifted him up spiritually and took him into a whole other realm where he forgot his pain he forgot his heartache he forgot his busyness and his stress and just sat in the presence of God you ever just want God to do that for you carry me up out of here let me forget even if it's for two minutes the stuff going on around me this family, I know, has had to have those moments in the last many, many days or you would not have made it. The Strums have had to have those moments in these last months and weeks with all that's going on or they would not have made it. The, the Golnicks with their grandbabies have had to have moments like that or we would not make it. Anybody that has not had to have God reach down and swoop them up just does not understand the joy, Pat, in seeing the presence of God bring them to new levels. Amen? And so Paul says, here's what happened to me because I was thinking about so much that went on. He said, so then I went up and, and he's, he's talking about how he was moved up and on behalf of this man, he said, I will boast, but on my own, I will not accept of my weakness. Verse six, 
Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Well, I would venture to say we all have that thorn in our flesh then, don't we? Because the messenger of Satan comes along every stinking rotten day. Amen? In some way, shape, or form, every day of our lives, Satan comes along and says, I don't know why you're playing that because I'm not going to allow that to happen. You know, with all of our plans yesterday, Love, Inc., our, our esteemed executive director of Love, Inc., who I have not given a hard time in a while, but it's coming, Carol, okay? They had their, their uh, golf outing yesterday to raise money for an absolutely fantastic organization, great ministry. And you know, what they have scheduled all day long? I mean, I'm serious. I think Cadillac is probably going to float away with all the rain we've had. And I prayed for them as much as I prayed for the block party because that's a good time. And, and I don't know this for sure, but I hear it's tough to, to golf in a pouring down rain. Just guessing. And so I knew that they wanted to have a good day. And you were probably thinking, hey, Carol's got a lot more faith than me, though. She's thinking, eh, if it happens, it happens, right? I mean, if it rains, that's fine. We'll play water golf. That'd be wonderful. But it worked out, and it did, except for that cut on Pat's eye. I'm still concerned about it. But otherwise, God lets it work out. We just have to trust him. But Satan's always there. You can't do it. It's going to rain. You can't do it. Nobody will show up. Can I tell you something he tells me every Sunday morning without fail? I don't know why you're driving up there. No one wants to hear what you have to say. For 30 years he's told me that. I don't know why you're going in there. Nobody's going to show up. Well, that's never happened. I don't care how small the crowd is. Somebody always shows up. Amen? I don't know why you're doing that. Nobody wants to hear preaching anymore. Nobody wants to hear the truth. People just want their ears tickled. I, I, I have never met anybody that let me tickle their ear, nor have I had the desire to do that. That could get you in trouble. So I understand that all he's trying to do is get in the way of the work of God. Amen? And even with Paul, because Paul was having such a great time, Paul was being blessed Paul's hanky was in the air, you know. He was waving it. He was getting ready to shout, and Satan comes along and reminds him of what? What do you think Satan could use against Paul every day of his life now that he has become a child of God and the great New Testament writer and the great established of church? He would say, yeah, you see that guy over there? You killed his grandpa back when you were Saul. Hey, See this group of people over here? They're still mourning the loss of their father, which, by the way, you had something to do with when you were persecuting the church. You don't think Satan would do that? Absolutely, because he doesn't fight fair. In fact, fighting isn't fair. Amen? That's all he did. And so he says, unless I could just get to a point, Ellie, to that I can't stand it anymore, I'm so happy that my bones fly out of my skin. He said there's a messenger from Satan to come along and say, hey, hey, Dave, you having a good day? How about your shoulder? I bet that hurts a little bit. And he takes us something and just kind of jabs you there, right? Or he'll say, hey, remember two weeks ago when this happened? Two weeks ago, all he lives for, all he exists for is to steal the concentration and the focus, Edie, and the joy of a child of God. You know what I'm here to tell you? Yes, the sun's not out. Yes, it's 10 to 12. Yes, you got things on your mind and all that. And yes, coming to church sometimes can feel like going through the motions. But I'm here to tell you from the bottom of my heart, Satan is a liar. And all he's trying to do is rock the church to sleep. That's all he's trying to do. To forget how powerful we are in Christ. To block out any good thing that he would give us, Ken, that could give us any foothold in growth in the Lord. He just wants to rock the church to sleep. Oh, that was a lovely day. We sat down. We heard some good stuff. You dropped your money in the plate, so you paid your tax, and now you can go off and do whatever you want. Don't listen to him. He's just up there. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't listen to the Sunday school teacher. Don't worry about coming back anymore during the week. Don't worry about praying this week. It's okay. You did your thing. He can make church feel like the end all, couldn't he? that there should be a time clock. Okay, Tom, we went to church. Ain't we great? And not be able to live for God in the power we should because we missed whatever he was trying to tell us. Amen? Amen? And so now, Paul, 
is physically, personally dealing with that. And so now he's having the time of his life. And Satan comes along, the messenger to buffet him. You know what buffet is? I had a great friend of mine, Larry Allen. He has since passed in Kentucky. He, he would always say that it was buffet because buffet is B-U-F-F-E-T, right? So he would read it, and he was a big dude. He said, I'm just like Paul. I buffet my body daily. I said, Larry, your version of the Bible needs a lot of help right there, doesn't it? But daily, he would have the messenger of Satan come along and go, yeah, look over there. Hey, yeah. I don't need anybody to remind me of my failures, do you? But yet Satan does it all the time. Why? Jody, to just keep us from growing, to keep us pulled back, to keep us from grabbing any ground whatsoever. So what did Paul do? Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. I'm surprised he left it at three. That would have been me night and day. Lord, could you get rid of this? Like my wife prays over me. Lord, would you just get rid of him? Please, rid me of this. Rid me of this. Please get rid of this. Remove it. I can't handle it. I can't function with this in my face over here reminding me, reminding me, reminding me. You've got to get rid of this. You can imagine the torment mentally and physically and spiritually that Paul had, Bonnie, every day. The messenger of Satan reminding him, pounding on him, beating on him with this. How bad he used to be. What happened here? God answered him. Church, can I tell you something? Never, ever, 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 ever say God didn't answer my prayer, okay? Please don't ever say that. You know why? God answers all of them. It just sometimes might be no. I hate even saying the word no. Because we all hate the word no. We have to say it sometimes, though. You know why? It's for our best interest, and God sometimes says no. And here, what does God say? I'm not going to remove the thorn, I won't change to what's going on around you, but I can work in you. My grace is sufficient for you. Isn't that good? My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest in me. What's he saying? If grace is that good, and if my weaknesses bring the best of Christ out of me, then I'm gonna focus on where I need him all the time. So that the good strength of God comes out of me every day. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. And here's exactly where all of us sit this morning. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says, if, if focusing on where I'm weak brings out the grace of God, then I'm as weak as a feather. And what does that mean for all of us this morning? Well, we talked this week about and you see in your notes, my grace is sufficient. It's enough. It's enough. It's really all we need, Bert. We just need the grace of God to cover us, to soak in us, to carry us in all those moments. Not just a couple of times a year, but to live in that every day. Amen? And so he says here, last week we've been looking on Wednesday nights in the organic uh, the, the organic church and the organic outreach stuff about the relationships that we have, how they develop on their own, just like a seed into a plant. They start the way they do, and then we develop relationships with people so that we actually have some impact with our words around them so that what we say, if I tell Linda things, she can say, I, I understand that he means what he says. He's going to come through. We don't just have surface relationships. And the people that we're going to lead to Christ, probably the best are going to be the ones that see this kind of grace come out of us. And that's what we talked about Wednesday. So some of this we're sharing back again from Wednesday night. Justice. Here are, here are two words that lead us to grace. What is justice? You get what you deserve, you know. You break the law, you pay. You speed and you get pulled over, you pay a ticket, right? You're not wearing your seatbelt, you get in trouble. You disobey your parents, kids, what happens? Right? Some of you think, don't, don't talk so loud because they don't know what I did. But when things go wrong, there is an immediate, you do wrong, you pay for it, amen? Most husbands understand that more than kids. Maybe I should have went that route. But mercy is not getting what you deserve. God shows mercy, Dave, on me every day by not giving me what I deserve, praise his name. That's mercy. We start out with, you know, if, if this was a, an automatic 
perfect world that just went the right way, you'd get that for doing this. But thank God he doesn't operate that way and we get way more mercy, Deb, than we could ever imagine. Amen? Mercy, not getting what we deserve. But now we're talking about grace. Here's the best part. And, and, and I like mercy a lot, but grace is even better. Getting what we don't deserve. There's a difference. I used to get them confused and it's not that words matter, but to understand how loving and how protective and how gracious God is, Carol King, to look and to say, I'm getting, I didn't earn this. I didn't, I didn't pass a test to get his grace. I didn't beat somebody at a, at a, at a, a Bible beat contest, right, Tony? You know, I didn't stand up first. And if you don't stand up first, you don't get it. This is grace that he died on the cross to give to all of us. I don't deserve heaven. Are you nuts? I don't deserve any blessings, Donna, on this earth. If I could pick people out of this room that would deserve to never, Donna, have a bad day in their lives, it would be everybody besides me because so many of you have lived it, have shown it, have, have walked it when no one else would walk it with you, but you did. And God gives you the grace to get through all of that to be where you're at right now. But can't we all sit and think in our brains and our minds and our hearts? And that takes the, the, the walking. I can't stand it. I'm going to say it for the last time today. Watching people serve God that look like they're going to get shot. Bless God, I'm a Christian. Woo. Sorry, I didn't mean to be so loud. I just get excited. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Don't hurt yourself there, pal. Right? Well, you don't know how tired I am. Yeah, I do. We're all tired. But I'm also full of joy that Jesus saved me. Well, you want me to walk around on top of the seats like some people do? No, I want you to be you. But I can guarantee you, I'm not going to look like I'm watching a Hallmark movie in the room. Can I tell you what happened to me again this weekend? They, they, they sabotage me every time on the weekends. I get in my chair and I have the remote, but then Reagan always wants to sit in the chair with Dad, and I don't care if she's 85. That would make me really old, but um, she wants to sit in the chair with me and cover up. That's fine with me, right? Nobody's going to ever tell your kid, hey, no, you're, you're, too, you're too long. Get away. Nope, as long as she wants to because Connor stopped doing that a long time ago. So she always comes over, and she sits in the chair with me and cover up, and I have the remote, but then they catch me because I haven't watched what I'm on, and all of a sudden, Cheryl looks around and goes, where's the remote? And I go, it's in an undisclosed bunker with Dick Cheney, right? Remember when you used to hear that all the time? The vice president is in an undisclosed uh, place, and most people like that, probably. So the remote, we can't find it, Pat, anywhere, right? And they find it, and next thing I know, there I am, Reagan's laying on me, my arm's falling asleep. They've turned it to Hallmark. Reagan falls asleep, Jim, and the remote is on a mountaintop in Minnesota someplace. And there I sit, watching this stupid movie, Jim, and I keep, and then, but, the, and I've said this a million times. I sit there and keep watching it, and then I have nothing else to do because I'm not tired yet, and I start liking the stupid movie. And there I sit. You talk about needing the grace of God. I've just explained the most horrendous situation. Anyone would need the grace of God. And maybe that's your life situation right now. You feel trapped, and you're not in control of anything around you, and nothing in front of you is good, and you feel like you're weighed down. I'm telling you, the grace of God can bring you freedom from that, but you, it won't happen until you decide to allow it to. He, it doesn't just zoop in like a buzzard and say, all done. There has to come a moment when you're like, I am tired of this situation. I am tired of the heaviness. I am tired of, of not being patient and letting God in. He needs to have it all. And that's what Paul finally did. Mike, he said, take it. And God said, I'll do you one better. I'll get into you even stronger. You'll still have the pain, but you'll have me even better and stronger and more prevalent and more apparent in your life. Amen? That's what we need. And so grace I don't deserve it here's ways we can share it though we talked about this Wednesday and then we'll, we'll move through this to close how can you show it because you know what you can't show what you don't know hey that's tweetable by the way if you want to tweet that out sometime today that's good you, you really can't Chase I can't teach you you know what do you, you like basketball oh I knew I'm in trouble here now what any kind of sport Man, you're nine foot tall. How can you not like a sport? I don't understand that. Yeah. So I'm going to teach Chase basketball because he doesn't like it, okay? And I'm great at it, right? You know, I, I can dribble. 
I have milk on my face all the time when I drink. I dribble. Oh, that's a different kind of dribble. Sorry. But if I'm going to show him that, I better have a passion about it. I better try to know a little bit about what I'm doing. And I'm afraid the reason why a lot of times people aren't coming to know God is because a lot of the Christians aren't very gracious. Hello. We got a little holier than thou attitude or you're not doing it right. And he said Wednesday, you can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians because they're not. I don't look like a bodybuilder for a reason, right? I'm not ever going to be a hair model for a reason. You can't expect me. How come he never wipes any hair out of his eyes? Because there isn't any hair in his eyes. How comes a Christian over here, this non-Christian person, isn't showing much love? How come this non-Christian person over here isn't acting very godly? Because they don't have God in their life. It's time for us to step down and not judge and look at them and go, boy, you know what? If I spent some time with them, I bet I could show them Jesus. Amen? Instead of bad, right? Greg, I'm not pointing at you. It's down here at this empty chair. How can we show grace daily? Get this. Start doing it today when you leave this room. Show them reckless love reckless love what does that mean don't put conditions on it don't expect something in return you know don't it's like loving a puppy you show a puppy shows up at your doorstep some love you got them the rest of your life a lot of people aren't like that and, and people have to feel like do I deserve to be loved if you have breath in your body you deserve to be loved showing them that laying it out there Cinda when you got a house full of boys and you got to feed them lasagna right how do you handle that you show them love what if they drop a big piece right on your carpet in the living room? What do you do? Take them by the... No, you show them love. Every day. Reckless love. Amen? Amen? What do you do next? Generous forgiveness. How many of you forgive easily? You hear that? Somebody got excited about forgiveness out there, didn't they? Yeah. They found the cake. <laughs> I didn't even say in conclusion yet. What do you think about that? Generous forgiveness and not, I'll forgive you, Terry, till the next time, right? And I'll bring it up later. Aren't we good at that? My mom and dad used to, when they would have, they would call, call them just loud discussions when they weren't seen eye to eye, which was a few and far between. But my mom would say, you know what happened the last time you did that? He'd go, Barbara, you forgave me for that. I forgave you, but I didn't forget. You know, and she would, she would, she would ask him to forgive him later and he goes I don't know I'm just not ready yet you know he would make a big deal about it generous forgiveness forgive forgive what's holding us back now is that we try to use that as a bargaining chip you know Patty I don't know I'm just I gotta think about it just forgive the world would move a lot better if we forgave amen and I'm talking generously then sharing what we have sacrificially what do you have what do I possibly have that anybody could want you have Jesus it's not a car it's not clothes it's not money not even knowledge it's the experience you have with the Lord right now here's the thing if it's not current it's kind of hard to share it my vast knowledge isn't going to work Heather it's where I'm at with him right now you know what it's even good sometimes Cheryl to admit somebody comes at you and they say well you know I'm having a real hard time in my faith because I'm not sure that I can trust God in this situation you know what you say I've been there and I can't tell you there's a formula what to do, but I can tell you if you just trust him and continue to talk to him about it, he'll never leave you or forsake you. I think people need honesty like that more than they need some big, long theological word that none of us know how to pronounce. Amen? Amen. Sacrificial sharing. And lastly, he says, if we engage with him freely. What does that mean? He talks about, when last Wednesday, and I thought this was funny, a lady in his church in California that showed up, and I forget her name. But... She was very rough around the edges. She was very from a, a tough, tough street background. And she walked into church, and uh, I'm paraphrasing it, but she walked into church one Sunday, and uh, she sat down, and her language was just not what you think that you would hear in church, right? So a lot of churches would have probably said, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't be here today because you're, you're not using words that we use in the church house. That's exactly where she should have been was in the church house. Get over it. Because she's not, what? God's not in her heart. And so she was sitting there and she came up to him and she was saying, you know what, preacher? 
you know, you, you're, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm just not ready yet. And God, you don't know what I've gone through in my life. And she's dropping some words in there. And he said, every time she would say one, he would get a, go into a little bit of a fit like that and go, but listen, you know, God's good. And she's, you know, you know, kept saying stuff. And finally, after a while, long story short, as, as she began to blossom, as she came up, she, she asked Jesus in her heart. She got saved. She asked him one Sunday a few weeks after that one moment when she was just telling him her heart and talking about all that she's lost and how bad her, the engaging part he was, had I not let her open up her heart and speak to me and be herself and not fit a mold that she wasn't even in yet, we'd have lost her because she was the first, we were the first church she ever walked in. And I let her talk to me where she was. I engaged in that stand, not knowing where it was gonna take me, but I had to hear it. And when she allowed that, she found Jesus in her heart. She came up one Sunday and she said, would you mind if I gave the prayer this morning in church? He's like, wow, I don't mind, <laughs> but I don't know how you cleaned up your act lately with your mouth. He thought that to himself and he said, sure, you know. <laughs> she came up front, walked up there when it came time to pray. He said she stood up there, again, I'm paraphrasing, she stood up behind the pulpit and as she began to pray, it was like you were listening to Mother Teresa pray. The words flowed from her. God, we thank you for you're our creator. You're our sustainer. You are the one that has brought us here. Just thank you for the gifts of life that you've given us. Not once did they have to bleep her out in the, in the booth. <laughs> Why? She was allowed to come and be herself, and God did the changing. Not us. As a matter of fact, when somebody tells me I need to change, Ken, I tend to bristle against that a little quicker. When God does, I'm like, you got it, God. And I think the worst thing we can do is try to have people come in and say, I'm going to need to sit and talk to you over here in the corner for about 10 minutes and see if you're worthy of being with us. Now, we've never said that, but we can act like that sometimes. Hello. One, there we go. I got two. Like an auctioneer. We can't do that. None of us are here because we're so great. None of us are here because we've figured it out. None of us are here because we sneeze ice cream, Right? We're here because we need Jesus in our hearts. Now, some have accepted him and some have not, but he made us all. We've got to allow people to engage or they're never going to have this grace in their lives. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 says this. Mike comes with a song. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he loved us long before we had any hope, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Amen? And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. You ever heard this verse before? And this is not your own doing. It is the what of God, the gift. And he closes it with not a result of works so that no one can boast. So the competition's over. There's nothing you're going to do any better than anybody else to receive any more grace. You just have to accept what God has for you. Amen? It's a great book called What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey. And here's a quote from that. The many uses of the word in English convince me that grace is indeed amazing. Truly our last best word. It contains the essence of the gospel as a drop of water can contain the image of the sun. The world thirsts for grace in ways it does not even recognize. They don't even realize it's what they need, but we have it. Little wonder the hymn Amazing Grace edged its way to the top 10 charts 200 years after its composition. For a society that seems adrift, and it is, without moorings, I know of no better place to drop an anchor of faith than in the grace of God. Amen. Stand with us if you would. Father, we love you today. And I'm thankful that I'm not loving an ideal or some club or some, some thing that people dreamed up on a, on a bar stool somewhere years ago or in some backyard or on a plane. It's not some idea hatched by people trying to get money or trying to become famous. This is a, the Savior of the world said, I love the people I created and I want to give them peace for eternity. And your grace, which is us getting what we, what we did not earn, your riches, 
And we just are the recipients of that by receiving it. But now I, I do have to say today, God, to remind us all that you, you don't just stand there with your hands up. We have to come obediently. We have to have our sins forgiven. We've got to come and just lay it all at your feet and say, this is me. This is the engaging part. Because those things I shared that we have to do, you already do every day. We can come to you completely barren of any pretense say this is me there's so much of this I don't like and I need you to fill it with your spirit and with your grace will you do that and you'll say yes maybe there's some that need to come and do that to experience the great getting what we don't deserve and I pray that would happen while we sing in Jesus name amen page 85 if you have a hymnal <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. singing today. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Let me mention a couple of things. Um, Tanson's open house. Uh, Tanson Howard, she graduated already, but we're, we're going to uh, celebrate her open her graduation and all she's got coming up ahead of her. But it's going to be two weeks from yesterday. Uh, Bolton says the 20th, but uh, Bert wanted me to make sure I say the 29th, which is two weeks from yesterday. What time is that? one to five back in the fellowship hall so come and go uh, would be a great time don't forget that Bible school yes it's that time again if no one's if the man with the black hood hasn't come knocking at your door he will trust me 
And that means you're coming to get um, volunteers. The theme is roar. Life is wild, but God is good. Amen? We can teach our kids that for sure. July 22nd to the 26th, it's that week. Uh, Cheryl's going to have a meeting next Sunday for everybody that would like to be involved in it. It doesn't matter how small or how big you want to be involved in the uh, gray room down there right after church next Sunday, okay? And then... Um, I think that's it, but make sure you look at the book. That's just the two things I wanted to make sure I make notice. Tomorrow night, no, Tuesday night is uh, softball. We are tearing it up. We had a great time. Uh, I think it's that red, white, and blue eye paint that Jandy makes us all wear. But uh, softball is Tuesday night, 6.30 and 7.45 over on the lit field. And But we play lit too, don't we? That's why we're on the lit field. I don't know if that's good or not. It just sounded good, right? Yeah, Tuesday night's Bible study. Yeah, I don't play, Carol. I just stand out there and clap. Yeah, that's all I do. They get, they'll be fine without me for one week. Somehow, right? Yeah, Gary, close us in prayer.